So, so John, it, it's got to be difficult for you. I mean, for, for a non-believer, having the conversation and continuing to have the conversation is extremely important. We have time for people to change their minds one way or the other, which whoever wrote that was making an allegory, a fable. Okay, so now I get to introduce uh, our moderator for the evening. He's currently the CEO of Secular Media Group LLC, LLC and the founder of AtheistAudioBooks.com. He is the author of Baptized Atheists, and his weekly live radio show has had nearly 3 million downloads with over 140,000 listeners every month. So, ladies and gentlemen, to host the Dogma Debate, David Smalley. It'll make you laugh, but most importantly, this is Down the Debate with David Smalley. It was Wednesday, March 25th, 2015. This is the Dogma Debate. I'm your host, David Smalley, and we are broadcasting live from Sacramento, California. Your checks are in the mail. Thank you so much for coming out. Without any further ado, I want to get started, and I want to talk about uh, this exciting show that we have, Jesus, Lord or Legend. This is going to be a debate from two guys who have actually been on this live broadcast. Um, but I think uh, most of you have heard David Fitzgerald on the show. You've heard John Christie on the show. I did a film with John Christie uh, last year called My Week in Atheism. There are actually copies of it over there. Um, where we tried our best to make an atheist out of John Christie. That didn't work out too well. No, but it, it's a very fair film. It's a very good film, and, and I think John did a great job directing it. It, it gives you a, a deep inside look from a Christian perspective, which I think is super, super important. So I want to go ahead and introduce the folks that are going to be here debating today. The whole concept here, Jesus, Lord or legend, is Jesus the real deal, or is Jesus... A legend passed down. So that's what we really want to try to figure out today. Taking a poll before we saw that I think this is majority, slightly majority Christian audience, which is, which is a good thing. But there are several people here who are non-believers and about four who just do not care at all. <laughs> we saw you and I don't know why they're here. So if you're standing in the back, walk over to them and move them out of the way. You, you should sit down there. We're going to start with a guy who's been on the show several, several times. He was co-founder and director of the world's first atheist film festival. He's the author of The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion, book one, The Mormons, and his best-selling book, Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. He's currently working on the follow-up to that book titled Jesus Mything in Action. Please welcome David Fitzgerald. Hello, David. Hello, hello. Our next guest is a Christian filmmaker with a degree in religion and biblical studies who is beginning his graduate work this fall in Christian and classical studies. He's the director of the documentary, My Week in Atheism, and he's currently in production on a second documentary titled 40 Churches in 40 Weeks with Sharon Balam. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Christie. Guys, welcome back to Dogma Debate. The, the first time you guys were on, uh, I think John was in studio and David called in from San Francisco. You're from San Francisco, right? Yes. Yeah, and so now you guys are actually, it's the first time you've been in person, both of you, on Dogma Debate at the same time. Um, how do you feel? Ready to fight oh, yet? Punches could break at any time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could get ugly. I no, feel so a lot of love. <laughs> and David was also in the film, My Week in Atheism. That's right. Yep. That's right. Very cool. Yeah. So, so, John... Give us a quick breakdown, and I know we're going to get started. Uh, John's going to have an opening statement first, uh, right after the first break, and then David Fitzgerald's going to have a, an opening statement. Then we're going to kind of have a discussion period. I think that's really important. A lot of formal debates miss out on that piece of it. You know, they do the formal debates. Each side gets to have their, their views heard, but they never really have a discussion with one another, and so it was important that we did that, and then they're actually going to take questions from you guys. So uh, I think that's an important uh, point to get across. John, what are you hoping at the end of the day people get out of attending this and, and, and listening to this debate? That the story we have of Jesus as presented in the New Testament is 
accurate and reliable, not only as historical information, but also as the gospel, which it is, the testimony of God's manifest work in this earth. And David, what is your point here? That the opposite is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a short segment. Uh, I guess we're done here. <laughs> So you guys actually met through this show. That's right. Right? That's right, yeah. And you basically lived down the street from each other. Well, one of you doing God's the work, the one of the other of you trying to undo all of that. Right. <laughs> we'll let you figure out which is doing which. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you feel about each other as, as people? I mean, obviously, John, uh, being a Christian. He the, has the, to like me. Well, he has to like <laughs> you, yeah. No, no, it's the... <laughs> At least um, until Judgment Day. The... <laughs> That was a joke. Wow. Total joke. Did you hear that? <laughs> That's funny. Light mics, John. Light mics. Yeah. yeah, if you've ever heard of this show before, you'll get it. Like, <laughs> this is, this is kind of what happens all the time. So, so John, it, it's got to be difficult for you. I mean, for, for a non-believer who is friends with a believer, it's not offensive to a non-believer that you exist, right? It's not offensive <laughs> that the, the things that you say aren't, aren't a problem. But I think for, a, for believers, and, and I have a lot of respect for believers who befriend non-believers because uh, you talk about the issues, but, you know, you'll still go have a beer with the guy. You'll still go sit down and talk with him. And I think the one thing all three of us definitely agree on is that having the conversation and continuing to have the conversations is extremely important. But how, John, do you separate the friendly aspect of it from literally David Fitzgerald here trying to, you know, actively deconvert people out of Christianity, and you're actively trying to, to do that. Obviously, the friendship is not false. You guys are obviously friends. Right. I've been friends with you for a while. So how, how do you compartmentalize? How, how do you separate that, be able to have the debate, and still be able to, to shake his hand at the end of the day? I, I don't know that I separate it. Uh, first of all, you know, a little bit of David and I, I picked him up at the train station, and, you know, we came here together, which I think is pretty rare for a debate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But we're, we're genuinely friends. You know, we get along throughout the year. There's text messages back and forth, phone calls. Um, we've had dinner several times. So I don't know that I necessarily compartmentalize them. I okay. sometimes have just as much of a challenge among Christians who wear the label of Christian, but really don't know really what, uh, well, I'll be safe and say what the Gospels teach Christianity to be. And What's your email address, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> David at dogmadebate.com. Oh, that's great. <laughs> That's great. But um, so it's not a matter of compartmentalizing it. The way I look at it is, you know, we're all still here. We're all still thinking. Um, there's plenty of time for people to change their minds one way or the other, which happens in both cases. And that's what this is about, is doing the debate, doing the, the discussion. And, uh, and I plan on seeing both of these guys with me in eternity. So. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that answer. Are you good with that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think everybody's ready to get started. John's going to be first, so we're going to take a very, very short commercial break, and then we'll be back with John Christie giving his opening statement right here at the podium. More Dogma Debate coming up. This is Andrea from Sydney, Australia. Welcome back to Dogma Debate. Um, to go ahead and get us started with his opening statement, ladies and gentlemen, John Christie. Thank you. Okay, so tonight's debate is the question, is Jesus Lord or legend? Now by that I'm going to sum it up in one other question. Can we trust the Gospels? This is important because what skeptics will claim is that we don't know who wrote the Gospels, the testimony of, of Jesus Christ. And in fact, what they will say is that the Gospels were written, in some cases, hundreds of years later, into the second century. But what I'm here tonight to argue is not whether the Bible is the word of God, which happens to be my personal belief, but that's aside tonight. That's not my argument. My argument tonight is, can the Gospels be trusted? Are they trusted as ancient literature? Tonight is about investigating primary and secondary sources of the first century. While I do have my own beliefs, again, I want to emphasize those are not what we're talking about tonight. This is not a debate about God says so. This is a debate about primary and secondary sources. I want to do this tonight by defending the Gospels in three ways. First, that the Gospels are eyewitness testimony. Now, by that, I mean that they were taken by, again, first, primary sources 
who were there at the time of Jesus' ministry, who did walk with him, who did talk with him, who did learn from him, and either directly passed it down or gave that information to the author of the gospel. Second point is that the gospels were written early. By early, I'm going to claim tonight that all four were written before 70 AD, that they were not something that was done at the end of the first century or into the second century, but they were very close within the lifetime of Jesus. I'm also going to argue that the Gospels were authoritative. By that, I mean that they were trusted, they were circulated, they were taught from, and they were considered with apostolic authority, meaning they came from those who learned directly from Jesus. No one else has ever been given credit for any of these four Gospels other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's never been another person to stand up and take claim for those writings. There's never been another tradition attributed any name to those writings other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. David Fitzgerald, I'd like to draw your attention to the screen for a moment. You may recognize this graphic. <laughs> this is a graphic from David's book called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. This is called his timeline of supposed eyewitnesses to Jesus. Now, I want to focus on this tonight. And what I want you to focus on and notice is that very large gap there between the lifetime of Jesus and the end of the first century. This gap will lead people to believe that there are no eyewitness testimonies in the first century of Jesus Christ. The interesting thing about this chart is that all the names listed on the right, not one of them ever themselves claims to be an eyewitness. Not one of them is ever considered by any other author to be an eyewitness. So I'm not sure why this is referred to as a timeline of supposed eyewitnesses. None of these people are. What we're going to do tonight is focus in on the first century, this area in red. And we're going to look at who are the eyewitnesses and what information is missing from this chart. Now to do that, I need to fill in a couple dates quickly. I'm going to first take the crucifixion. Scholars will argue about this. Some will say 30, 33. Others will say 36 AD. I'm going to settle in the mid-ground at 33 AD. The next date that I want to bring up that's very important is the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem that occurred in 70 AD. This is very significant. We're going to go ahead and fill in here the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and now I'm going to begin with my timeline. Now, what I'm going to present to you tonight is pretty much what has, is becoming rapidly a consensus amongst modern biblical studies. This is a timeline that more and more biblical scholars are revising and getting closer to. And this is what I'm presenting to you. I'm going to begin first outside of the Gospels briefly with the book of Acts. Acts is a book written by Luke, who was a companion to Paul. And it is a two-part series. It's actually part two of a two-part series. The first being Luke, Acts being the second part. Now, Acts ends rather abruptly. Acts ends in chapter 28 with Paul in house arrest in Rome awaiting trial, but it never mentions anything beyond that. It says he stayed there for two years and he met with all that would speak with him. Now, this is very interesting because what Acts does mention is the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and the death of James, the brother of John, who both were disciples. However, we know that both Peter and Paul were executed under Nero. And in that time frame, we put it roughly between 65 to 67 AD. Now with that in mind, the book of Acts is 28 chapters. Every single chapter will either directly or indirectly mention, allude to, or tell a story about Peter and Paul. Yet he's completely silent on both of their deaths. The two most significant characters in the book don't get eulogized. It's a very odd thing, unless the book was written before they were executed. So this has caused many to believe that Acts can be placed roughly around 62 to 64 AD. If Acts is in that time frame, then Luke logically has to come before Acts. We're going to put Acts, uh, Luke probably about 60. Now Luke says right away in the beginning of his gospel that he gathered all of his information from eyewitnesses, people who were there. And he decided to write an orderly account because others had already written something about this Jesus. And so his information easily extends into the life of Jesus, first-hand eyewitness testimony that he wrote down. Most scholars also agree that the book of Mark was the first gospel written. 
Luke and Matthew both borrow from Mark. So we're going to put Luke, I mean, I'm sorry, we're going to put Mark in the range between the 40s and sometime in the 50s A.D. Now we know this also because there's topology that Mark references of cities that were, the names were changed after the destruction of Jerusalem. Yet he doesn't call them by the later names, he calls them by the earlier names. I can go into more detail about that, but because of time I'm going to move on. Matthew, we know borrowed from Mark as well. Matthew and Luke were, if not written at the same time, very close to each other. They actually seem to borrow from each other, or at least similar sources as well. And so Matthew falls in the same category. <clears throat> the one thing to make mention of about Matthew is that he is fixated on Judaism. He's, his gospel is about the Jewish Messiah coming for the world. He wants all Jews to understand this. Yet again, he's silent about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. He doesn't consider it fulfilled prophecy. He considers it future prophecy. This information that Matthew gathers is a lot of teachings as well. Matthew was a tax collector. He had a ledger. He sat at the feet of Jesus. This is why in Matthew you find passages like the three-chapter Sermon on the Mount in such detail. Matthew's information can easily extend into that period of Jesus' ministry. Now, we call these the synoptic gospels because they're interrelated. And all I'm doing here real briefly, and I have to move on, is showing you a slide that shows a comparison between Mark and Matthew and how they match up identical in a story. This is in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple. And notice where Matthew differentiates from Mark. He's not just telling something different, but he's doing that Jewish flair. Where Mark says, when you see the abomination of desolation, staring where, standing where it ought not to be. Matthew fills it in and says, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place. He's being very Jewish in his wording. At the end there where he talks about that, that you pray that it may not happen in winter. Matthew has to go one step further and say, pray that it does not happen in winter or on a Sabbath, because my audience is Jewish. So where they're different, there's no contradiction. There's just simply more information. What we know about these Gospels as well is that not only do they borrow from each other, but they fill in for each other. Now, this is not what people do when they copy. When you copy something directly, you copy. What Luke does with Mark is pretty interesting. Mark makes the claim at Jesus' trial that the soldiers began to spit on him and cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. But he doesn't tell us what the prophecy was. Was he looking for lottery numbers? Was he trying to tell them something of the future? What was the prophecy? Well, Luke fills this in for us. Borrowing the same passage, Luke says, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? Now the prophecy makes sense. He's blindfolded. He's being slapped in the face. Tell me who hit you. Mark doesn't give us that level of information. How did Luke know this? It's very simply because he talked to people who were there and who saw this and who gave that level of information. But let's move on. I want to add in here the Gospel of John. Now, I'm putting John before 70 AD as well. I'm aware that many people like to place him at the end of this century. The problem with that is that John makes this claim. He says in chapter 5, After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Notice the present tense. And Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there is, he moves to the present tense. I'm sorry, did I say present? He was in the past tense, now he's in the present. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. And then he goes on. In these lay a multitude of invalids, and then he says one man was there. The story is going from past to present to past again. The only reason he's mentioning that there is in Jerusalem a sheep gate which has a pool that has five colonnades, is because at the time of this writing, in the assumed time that his readers would be reading this, there would be a Jerusalem with a sheep gate and a pool near it that had five colonnades. The problem is that was all destroyed in 70 AD. It no longer existed. It was a pile of rubble. In fact, for many years, people claimed that John had made this up until over the last archaeological discoveries found this pool and it was by the sheep gate, and it had five colonnades. And John is all of a sudden credible. You only talk that way if you're referencing something current. John, as monk for many other reasons as well, was definitely written before 70 AD. 
But let's move on to another source, something outside of the Gospels. Let's look at the Apostle Paul and his ministry. Now, Paul, excuse me, was converted roughly between 33 and 36 A.D. to Christianity, depending on the date of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Paul spent many years under his revelation that he received from Christ, teaching and preaching this to Gentiles. He goes back to Jerusalem two times, once approximately in 36 to 39, a second time in 50 to 53, to line up his message with the message that the brothers have in the church in Jerusalem. And when he does, he comes to the agreement that they're all preaching the same thing. How is it that they're all preaching the same thing? Well, he tells us in 1 Corinthians, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Now that passage, Christ died for our sins, you can gather that from the Old Testament. However, they didn't see it that way at the time, but in hindsight being 2020, after Christ's resurrection, they did see the Messiah would die for their sins. So I'll give you that. However, the next statement he makes, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, Paul's using very technical language throughout 1 Corinthians 15, which we know is an early letter of Paul's. And he's claiming that Scripture teaches these things. The only place you're going to find any reference to the Messiah third day, raised on the third day, is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't find that in the Old Testament. Paul is recording this as Scripture. If they did not exist at the time Paul wrote this, or at least one of them, Not just an oral story, in scripture. Why is he making this reference? Now, Paul also quotes the Gospel of Luke. In his letter to Timothy, he says, For scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. That's a passage from Deuteronomy. He also says, And the laborer deserves his wages. You cannot find that anywhere throughout the entire Bible except Luke 10, 7, where it's an exact verbatim quote. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. At the end of Paul's life, Luke had been written. Luke was a companion. Paul knew Luke's scripture. It's very likely that the same passage in 1 Corinthians was referring to the gospel of Luke. All of this leads us to believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written before the destruction of the temple and were very early eyewitness testimony. Now, outside of biblical evidence, It's nice that we have some other people, like Clement of Rome, who David has on this slide at 95. I'm assuming he's claiming that's when Clement wrote his epistle to the Corinthians. First of all, that's not the only year that Clement lived. So by the fact that we don't see his lifetime, it leads that there's a gap. So Clement was born in 30, and he lived to 100 AD. So first of all, his lifetime, he was a contemporary of Peter and Paul, and he refers to their death. He talks about those beloved disciples. And in his letter in 1 Corinthians that some will attribute to the end of the first century, he does the same exact thing that John did. He says, not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices offered as if it's happening now, or the peace offerings, sin offerings, or trespass offerings, but in Jerusalem only. And even there they are not offered in any place, but only at the offer before the temple. He's speaking as if these things are there and you can see them. It wouldn't make much sense for me to draw any parallel to this using the World Trade Center's Twin Towers today, speaking as if they existed when we all know that they're not there anymore. I would talk about them in the past. Clement is letting his readers know they can go to the temple today and see these sacrifices, and he goes on. It's clear that Clement was written before 70 AD when there was no more temple. Furthermore, Clement quotes the Gospels. He quotes the words of the Lord Jesus and says that he spake, be ye merciful that ye may obtain mercy. Forgive that you can be forgiven. As you can see where this goes, if you know your Bible, you know this is clearly teaching of Jesus, almost verbatim. This is from Matthew and Luke. In addition to that, Clement says, remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to quote how he said, woe to the man by whom offenses come. If it were better for him that he had never been born, that he should cast a stumbling block before one of my elect. Yea, it were better for him that a millstone should be hung around his neck, and he should be sunk into the depth of the sea, than he should cast a stumbling block before one of my little ones. You'll find this passage in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, he's giving credit to Jesus speaking these words, 
in the same letter that he's giving credit that the temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem exists, these gospels were used authoritatively as the words of Christ before the destruction of the temple. So we have the gospels, we have Paul, and we have Clement. We also have on this chart two other names, Ignatius and Polycarp. Again, Ignatius is listed as 110. Well, that's the year he died. Polycarp is listed as 155. That's not when they were born. Ignatius was born in 30. He lived at the same time as the disciples. In fact, he was a disciple of John. And he goes on to quote Matthew. He goes on to quote Luke. And he goes on to quote John. I don't have time to give those. I can do it later in the Q&A if you'd like. In addition, Polycarp, he was born in 69 and he died in roughly the 55-65 period. He also was a disciple of John. This is what you call a secondary source. And he quotes the Gospels as well. Between the two of them, they quote all four of the Gospels. Now the question is not whether they were quoting them before the destruction of the temple. At this point, that's become irrelevant. I think I've established enough for that. But what that shows is they carried it on. That these Gospels, from the time of their inception until well until the second and third centuries before we had a canon of scripture, were quoted from, taught from, they were considered authoritative, and they were changing people's lives. Now, we can add to this list Apius, Methetes, and the Epistle to Barnabas, all quoting from scripture, all of these early, early writings. But they're not on this chart, at least until now. What we need to do when we look at these is understand that through the first three centuries, before Constantine illegalized Christianity, where people like to believe the scriptures were compiled, which is not true at all, but I won't go into that. If we extend this to the second and third century, between the first, second, and third century with all the church fathers, we have over 19,000 quotes of the Gospels. Again, let me reiterate, 19,000. These are done in letters and lectionaries and different teachings. They're authoritative. They're not quoting from the Gospel of Thomas. They're not quoting from anyone else's writings other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If we extend that to the entirety of the New Testament, we have over 36,000. Over 36,000 quotes. We can almost put together all of Jesus' teachings, at least the nuts and bolts of what Christianity is, just from these alone if we had no Bible of our own. I want to close with a quote from Augustine of Hippo. Around 400, he wrote an apology against this exact argument. It was pretty much the first time that anyone had come and said, I doubt that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote those Gospels. And in his letter, or his apology, he says, in comparison, how do we know the authorship of the works of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and Varro, and other similar writers? but by the unbroken chain of evidence. Why do we trust these writings as being legitimately by the people they claim? Because over the years, they were quoted from, taught from, and respected. This is the same exact chain of evidence I'm trying to show you tonight. That from their initial writing to us today, the Gospels are intact. We have an extremely high rate, I'll wager up into the 90 percentile, of factual theological points that are accurate today as they are in the earliest manuscripts we have. We don't find differences. What we find is an extra N at the end of a word, an extra space, a missing word, but nothing that makes of any concern whatsoever. When we step back and examine the evidence closely, and we see that there is no gap, there is no time that the Gospels of Christ were not being taught and referenced during the first century. There is no timeline of supposed eyewitnesses, but there is a timeline of valid eyewitness testimony. Thank you. All right, now, for the counter presentation to what you just heard, ladies and gentlemen, David Fitzgerald. Here we go. 
So before we talk about what we're talking about tonight, I just want to reiterate what, uh, what John says and just bring up some things about what this talk is not about. Um, and first of all, it's not a gladiatorial fight. And I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, usually in, in debates like these, we go into it and the audience is already prepared to kill one or the other of the, <laughs> the, the uh, opponents. And uh, I think it's pretty abundantly clear that we have great affection for each other and uh, we're not that. Now that said, this is probably wrong time to say this, but I hate debates. I hate them. Um, and the reason I hate them is this, is because for two nights before the debate, I don't sleep. No, my brain at two in the morning is going, well, okay, if he says this, I'll say this. If he says this, I'll say this, and this, and I'll say this. And when it comes time to debate, you put together your slides, you pull graphics on the thing, and you never get the right thing, even though we've been calling each other, texting each other. So what are we going to talk about? Let's not talk about this. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the reliability of the Gospels. Just it. But great. Let's do it. We'll hone right in. So, um, here we go. <laughs> talking about the right. What we're not going to be talking about is what I'm most well known for, is saying that Jesus didn't exist. This is not about whether Jesus did or didn't really exist. This is not even about whether Christianity is true or not. But what I am going to argue is that regardless if whether Christianity is true or false, regardless of whether Jesus was a real figure or not, the evidence we have for him is not a reliable source for him, and it's not a reliable source for early Christianity. This is where it gets a little, um, what do you want to say? When it comes to biblical history, New Testament history, and above all, Jesus stories, there are so many rabbit holes we can fall down to. These are things I would like to be talking about, and I hope we talk about in the discussion, but I'm not going to jump on. First is the fact of forgery in the New Testament. He was mentioning what uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy. I was very surprised to hear him say that because it's well known that Paul did not write 1 Timothy. It's well known in secular biblical circles that Paul didn't write half of the letters attributed to him. And that's, I shouldn't say secular biblical circles because that's true in evangelical circles as well. Look up pseudo-Paulines, look up deuteropaulines, and you'll see that. Um, what's more, um, we can go further because it's not just forgery in the New Testament. It's also forgery of letters like Polycarp, letters like Ignatius, letters like these that he just mentioned. There are also mistakes in the New Testament. There are misquotes of scripture. Jesus misquotes scripture in Mark. There's errors in geography and Judean life and basics. How do we know that? Well, for one thing, because Matthew goes and corrects Mark's mistakes. There's also historical impossibilities. There's obvious fictions and there's anachronisms. We haven't even gotten to the date yet, but there are already things that just don't make up. No matter when these were written, they don't hold up. For instance, the portrayal of Pontius Pilate in all four Gospels. They're all slightly different, but they all show him as this dithering, hand-wringing, overly concerned dish rag who gets stopped over by the Jewish leaders, and they force him to, to crucify Jesus, basically. Ridiculous. Ridiculously crazy. What Everything we know from every ancient source about Pilate says that he was exactly the opposite. They complained that he did whatever the Jews begged him not to do and would refuse to do whatever they begged him to do. When he did finally get recalled from Rome, it wasn't from any reluctance to kill Jews. It was because he had one too many massacres of Jews, of Samaritans. There's also theological allegories. Uh, who can recognize that guy in the picture there? Anybody? Somebody said Barabbas, and you're exactly right. Here's the funny thing about the whole story of Barabbas. It's given details in Mark's uh, gospel. You've got uh, Barabbas, a rebel and sedition, um, who is guilty as sin of all the sins um, and yet for some reason he is released unharmed into the wilderness whereas Jesus the perfect Jesus who was not guilty of anything is crucified uh, when Jewish scholars looked at this and realized oh wait Barabbas that's Aramaic for son of the father we have two sons of the father one takes the sins of Israel sedition and murder on his head is released into the wilderness and the other one is perfect and is sacrificed to death and we can repeat that cycle throughout all four Gospels, but especially in Mark's, the first Gospel. Lack of corroboration from the rest of the New Testament. Paul and the other New Testament writers. Uh, John mentioned that Paul likes to say things about uh, Jesus was crucified on the third day. How does he know this? According to Scripture, kata grapha. Not just in accordance with the Scripture. That doesn't capture the real meaning of that. 
He says, according to scripture. How do we know this? Is it from what the, the apostles told him? No, he repeatedly tells us he didn't get his gospel from any man whatsoever. He got it from revelation from God himself and from scripture constantly. That's how we know he uh, uh, died. That's how we know he rose on the third day. And yes, that is attributed in the, the uh, Old Testament. Look up uh, Richard Carrier's book on the histories of Jesus, and he talks about the motive of, of the Messiah, not just suffering, not just dying, but rising on the third day. Um, also, the Lord's Supper. I bring up the crucifixion and the Lord's Supper because uh, scholars for generations have talked about the strange silence of Paul. And it's not just Paul, because it's all the writers of that first generation of Christianity. They seem to have no interest in Jesus whatsoever, except for the fact that he died on the cross, according to Scripture, and that he had a Lord's Supper. He doesn't say he has a Last Supper. And the interesting thing about that is that Christianity is not the only religion, and it's not the first religion to have a Last Supper. Sorry, a Lord's Supper. In fact, even in the New Testament, Paul complains about all the other Lord's Suppers being done by the pagans. Those are the cup of demons, but this is our Lord's Supper. For us, there's only one Lord and one God, and we have to take this one. Don't take those ones. There's also the lack of cooperation outside the New Testament. All right, here's a, a, a chart that should be familiar to you by now. Um, why is this say eyewitness timeline? Well, in the book itself, it talks about these are the ones that are commonly trotted out as eyewitnesses. They are not eyewitnesses. He rightly points out they don't even claim to be eyewitnesses. And yet you go into like a typical Josh McDowell book, uh, other apologetic books, and these are the guys, these are the names you'll get. And even some other names that, have, that are ridiculously uh, uh, unnecessary to be in there from the 5th century, 6th century. Um, here's the thing. History in the gospel, there are so many things in any of the gospels that should have been noticed outside Christianity. For instance, uh, the main one, uh, just the main one right there in the center, all the uh, dead saints in Jerusalem came out of their graves in Jerusalem, walked into Jerusalem, and appeared to many. And yet, for some reason, even though we have many accounts of what was going on in Jerusalem at that time, we have many accounts of much less interesting messiahs and would-be saviors. Not only does Jesus never make the cut in that report, any of those, he never leaves a footprint at all outside the gospel, outside of Christianity, but neither do accounts like this that would have been noticed by everybody but aren't even noticed by the other gospel writers. And we can, we can expand that, examples of that out. Uh, for everything that happens in Jesus' life. Not to say they should have noticed. That huge gap that was in the chart, one thing it should have been filled up with is that there were plenty of contemporary notices who did notice things going on in Jerusalem, in, in Judea, in Jewish life. Not anything about uh, uh, Jesus. Even though some of these people, like Gallo, actually appear in the Gospels. And the Gospels themselves. Yeah, we have four Gospels, but it should be pointed out there are a few discrepancies behind them. In fact, there's so many discrepancies that when you take the three synoptic gospels, the first one, and you take John's gospel, it's like they're not even talking about the same person. In fact, John's gospel has Jesus, well, the synoptic gospels have him as a secret messiah, some have said. John's gospel has him declaring that he's God openly right out of the gate. So there had to have been a rock shortage in Jerusalem to keep him being from stoned to death five minutes in the gate. It makes no sense historically at all. And then there is the blackout period of early Christianity. And I want to talk about his, I want to push back on that quote he has about the quotations from, uh, uh, from second century church fathers. First of all, they are second century church fathers. Why don't we have any quotes from first century church fathers? Why don't we have any fragments of anything from the first century? Why don't we, why don't people, why aren't people talking about the gospels in the first century? Uh, he mentioned um, Clement of Rome quoting from the Gospels, except his quotes don't match exactly what we have in our Gospels to any of our Gospels. So how can that be that the leader, a major church leader in Rome, can't even quote a Gospel? He seems to be paraphrasing from something that's not ours. What's worse than that is he says that Clement of Rome talks about the death of Paul. He sure does. He doesn't say Paul was killed in Rome. He says that Paul was died in Spain. That, that is our earliest Christian witness, or record rather, of the death of Paul. Not that he was martyred in Rome, but that he died in Spain. Um, this is the size of fragments we have of the New Testament well into the second century. Um, that first one there at the lower left-hand corner is P52. It's the oldest 
uh, fragment of the gospel we have, it is always dated between 125 to 175. We don't have any way of fine-tuning that range anymore, and every Christian I know always says, oh, it comes from the year 125. No, that's the very lowest uh, ebb of it. Um, these, these scraps, and, and P25 basic will fit on a credit card. That's the size of this. We don't get complete uh, books of the New Testament until clear into the second century. We don't get complete New Testaments until the 4th century, and then we have two of them, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Now, here's the thing about that. Those Bibles are not the same as each other. They have books that the others don't have. Both of those books have books we don't have. We have books both of them don't have. So it's even pushed back further than that. He gave a number, uh, what was it, 19,368? I thought, what? That is a Number. He must have got that from Josh McDowell. And I look, and sure enough, yes, Josh McDowell is saying that. Um, when you look at somebody, that has been shown false by Bruce Metzger, who has also made similar inflated claims, and yet shows that if we look throughout the whole second century, these exact quotes we have aren't exact quotes. And these quotes from some things like, like Papias, whose quotes from a, a gospel he calls Matthew and a gospel he calls Mark, when he's telling us what these are, they're clearly not our gospel of Mark and our gospel of Matthew, meaning that either our gospels weren't around then or they were changed into something else completely different from what he was talking about in the middle of the second century. And we can expand that example uh, frequently as well. Um, let's keep moving. Ignoring spelling and grammar errors, and there are thousands of them, there, in fact, no two uh, New Testament texts are the same, period. That's not a problem. That's not what we're worried about. What we are worried about are the many, many passages in which scholars cannot agree is the original true reading. And actually, I always had another thought in there. Um, what is worrisome is not that there are changes and not that there are differences, but when there are, different, there are deliberate changes and deliberate changes, and we don't have any way of knowing who did the changing and who was the original. In fact, the problem's even worse than that, because even if we did have a copy of the original text in our hands, we have no way to tell if it was the original. And again, for the first hundred years of Christianity, we have nothing, nothing. No scriptural evidence, no textual evidence. We don't have any uh, uh, people talking about the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't have them quoting them. We don't have this until the end of the first century for Matthew and Mark, and not until the second century for all the rest. It gets worse than that, because that's a bad situation for any historical claim, but for Christians it gets even worse, because here's the catch-22. If the Holy Spirit inspired the originals, as we're often assured, and I'm sure John believes, then why couldn't he also preserve the original? Because we do not have that. Apologists try to assure us that this doesn't matter. This isn't a problem, they say, because it doesn't threaten anyone's salvation. Well, how do they know? How could anybody know? We don't have any way of knowing. For the first 100 to 150 years, possibly as late as 250 years, we have no idea what the Christians were writing in their, uh, their um, scripture because our oldest manuscripts don't match what we have in ours. And if it doesn't matter, then why do Christian biblical scholars spend their entire careers fighting over which is the original reading? Okay, all of these concerns and still others are important issues for the reliability of the New Testament, and I want to talk about all of those because those are what is firm in my mind when we talk about these things. But let's talk about a few core issues. How much time do I have? All right. What biographical information, reliable or not, do we have for Jesus? Well, ultimately, everything we know about Jesus' biography stems not from Paul, not from the epistles, not from anything outside the Gospels, but from these four Gospels. So who wrote them and when? Well, John will tell you that it's exactly these four guys whose names are attributed to them. Not true. Not true at all. And were the eyewitnesses? They are not eyewitnesses. For, let's, for starters, just read them. They don't claim to be eyewitnesses. They don't read like eyewitness accounts. They don't say, I knew Jesus when I first met him in 1952, and we did this and we did that. They don't read anything like that in the first person. They're all in the third person. They all are titled, and these titles came, originally these were all anonymous, but these titles that were assigned to them were called the gospel according to, not the gospel according by or the gospel of, the gospel according to, which is already a, uh, a sign that this is of a tradition, not of a specific author. And those names to that tradition 
were fought over. As we already said, there were already other Matthews, other Marks, other Peters, other Johns, all these other Gospels. There many, how, anyone to take a guess how many Gospels we know of from the second century? He's, he's in about 50, and that's not a bad answer. At least between 35 and 50 that we know of or that we have fragments of. In fact, our second oldest uh, papyrus fragment is from a gospel we don't know what it is. It's a totally unknown gospel. Um, all of them were originally anonymous. All of them have been edited and added to, and sometimes accidentally interpolation, sometimes deliberately. And all were written, written long after the facts they described. Now, how do I know that? Well, here's another timeline. We like timelines. All right. Mark is, doesn't just allude to the destruction of the temple, but the whole gospel appears to be written in response to it. And Mark 13's little apocalypse is nothing short of a survival guide for the survivors of the war with Rome, um, which is why the majority of scholars, evangelical, well, except, except I should say for the hardline evangelical, but the majority of biblical scholars are very comfortable saying this was written sometime in the 70s. Mark and Matthew, Matthew and Luke, as John says, they borrowed from Mark. They borrowed from him. So they have to come later still. Well, Luke also borrowed some of his historical details from Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, from a book that was written in the year 93 or 94. Um, we know that for a fact, and we know that it was Luke doing the stealing from Flavius, not the other way around, because in all the cases where we have these parallels, Luke has got his information not quite right, um, Flavius does it have in, in the right context. He gives more information. He gives it in the proper order. It's part of the story. He doesn't just throw it out as window dressing. And every single point, curiously, that Flavius brings up, Luke happens to bring up too, just those exact same ones, just happened to pull those three at random, you know. Uh, so it's very odd, obvious that uh, the Gospel, Luke, and the Acts were uh, based on a book that was written in 93 and 94, which is why secular scholars will say that this is probably written in the second century around 116 or so. The synoptic problem. When we say Mark, Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark, that's a very euphemistically way to put it. What they did was Matthew, supposedly an eyewitness, took the story of Mark, who's not an eyewitness, he's supposedly the, the secretary of Peter, took this story cut and pasted it, copied it, corrected his mistakes, added things he wanted to add, and took it in completely new directions. But he didn't write his own story. An eyewitness did not write his own story. He took somebody else's story, a non-eyewitness, and beefed it up, corrected his mistakes, and, and put it together. And also doesn't write in the first person, doesn't claim to be Matthew, doesn't claim to be an apostle. Luke does the same thing too. Uh, in fact, Luke uh, steals from Matthew and from Mark. Some scholars say that that is what Q is. It's, it's material they share in common, though we've never found Q. And uh, there's a growing number of scholars who think Q never existed, along with M or L or all these other hypothetical oral traditions or, or pre-literary uh, sources for the Gospels. Um, Luke, take the material we call Q, is where Luke is taken from Matthew as well as Mark. So we call it the synoptic problem. Really, it should be called just the synoptic isn't that an interesting situation that all these Gospels are pulled from each other. It's really not a problem unless you want the Gospels to be something they aren't, independent eyewitnesses' uh, accounts. Um, Luke contains 55% of Mark still, word for word. Matthew contains 90% of Mark. So the ramifications of this is we don't have four independent sources for Jesus. We only have one that the others have been built on. The authors of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke felt free to alter, add to, and remove parts of the stories they didn't like. That is not what historians do. That's what theologians do. John came later still, and though he's still working off Mark's basic story and reworking it to make things uh, shake up, in fact, if you take the Synoptic Gospels and take John, they don't match up almost in any sense of the word at all, not even on basic timeline stuff. Um, I, you saw on that discrepancy, none of them agree on like who John the Baptist was, what his relationship was with Jesus. None of them agree when Jesus died, when Jesus was born. We have no dates for anything that happened from Jesus' birth to Jesus' death. They are all those years that were spewed out were guesses work. The thirty we say thirty one thirty well it had to be a, a 
year that Passover was on a Friday during Pontius Pilate's reign, unless John was right, because he says it didn't happen on Passover, the day after Passover, which had to have to make it a different year, year altogether. They can't even get the same day slash year right for these things that are happening. And when you read just the last two weeks of the, uh, Jesus's life, just read the last two weeks of what was happening. Um, they're doing completely different things in different, different ways for completely different reasons. John, Jesus gets in trouble for raising Lazarus from the dead. That's what gets him in trouble with the Jews. Lazarus doesn't even show up in the other Gospels, except as a fictional character in one of Luke's parables. The construction of the Gospels. Uh, the differences are not the result of eyewitness testimony or differing oral tradition. No. Why do we know that? Because when they match, they don't match just a little bit. They match lockstep, except when they're making deliberate changes or when they contradict the others irreparably. The differences that they make are deliberate literary choices, and they're made by each new author and even later editors, because as I said, all of them have been added to for theological rec reasons. And again, that's just do we have the original. Not anything to the point of, yeah, this is the original, this is what the original wrote. Was it true? Was it true, or were they just making it up? And was Mark's gospel even meant to be taken as history in the first place? Well, there are many, many signs that that's not the case. Whoever wrote Mark was not an Aramaic-speaking uh, 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 apostle palling around with Jesus in the first century. He was a highly educated uh, person, well-versed in Greek classical forms and theology. He spoke Greek, not Aramaic. He employs many story elements that make no sense at all historically, like Jesus' trial, like Pontius Pilate, like the Sea of Galilee having storms on it. Um, but all these things that make no sense at all historically, and many, there's many, many more of those, they all have theological and symbolic meanings. Jesus' travels, when you read Mark's gospel, they make no sense geographically. And uh, uh, church fathers like Origen complained about this, saying that uh, if you try to put this on a literal interpretation, it makes no sense. That's almost a word-for-word -word quote of him. He seems to pop here and there at random. He said, Origen said, you have to interpret these things mystically and spiritually. Um, Mark has created character and place names that are conveniently apt. Um, and this tradition continues with the other Gospels as they add in more characters or give names to characters who weren't named. And those character names are suspiciously apt. I'll give you an example. Joseph of Arimathea, um, it's not a coincidence that Joseph is also the name of Je Jesus' father, but Arimathea is a town that never seemed to have existed before the Gospels were written. What's Arimathea mean? Well, Arimathea means best discipleville, basically, in Aramaic. It's completely, extremely coincidental and very apt. And you see that with characters and place names throughout the Gospels. Um, he does other things that are very sophisticated. He uses literary tropes and methods like reversing expectations. Like, the reason that no one's heard this story before is because the women ran from the tomb and didn't tell anybody. That's how Mark's Gospel originally ends. He does a thing called intercalation. There's nothing wrong about it or strange about it. It's just breaking up a scene and slipping in, sandwiching another scene in it for emphasis or dramatic effect. But one thing it does tell us is that when, when the other Gospels make their breaks at these seemingly arbitrary points, the, that is a sign, one of the signs, one of the many signs, that they're copying from Mark, not making up their own story. There's a chiastic structure that emulates Old Testament passage. In fact, the entire structure of his unfinished sentence here, to be finished, uh, of his gospel emulates uh, Old Testament figures like Elijah, uh, like Jonah, like Zechariah. Um, and he does a deliberate use of uh, vernacular. He speaks, his Greek is a folksy, rustic, grammatically loose form of coiny Greek. He's a very smart guy pretending to be a very down-home, just play, oh shucks kind of guy, Matlock style. And there are more and more and more. So our original biography of Jesus doesn't appear to be a biography at all. It's an allegory. And every single gospel we have after that, every single commentary we have from second, uh, some secondary sources is based on that. So that said, let the discussion begin. Anybody changed their minds yet? You guys, you guys still have some work to do. You That's guys still have debates. some. This is why I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do now is have this open discussion. But during the presentations, both folks were taking a lot of notes. 
And so John actually wanted to go back to a slide, which has got to be a little frustrating for our radio listeners. So um, we'll put on the website, on dogmadebate.com, as well as our Facebook page, a link to where you can actually watch this online uh, once it's all ready. Uh, so John, I know you're, you're actually talking about the slide you have up here. So you can actually start off the discussion um, and tell us why you wanted to address this slide. I'd like to try to focus on in this, because there's a lot thrown out there by both David and I, is try to narrow it down to who wrote the Gospels and in what time frame. And in doing that, we end up with this borrowing that we both have talked about, which some will say is called the synoptic problem. And so it's hard sometimes for people to visualize. And David had thrown out a number that Luke comprises 90% of Mark. And that Matthew was, I think the number was 50%? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Okay. Um, 50 90. 50 and 90. Okay, so Matthew uses 90% of Mark and Luke uses 50% of Mark. Um, what we have here before you is the four Gospels, Luke being the largest. It comes in at about 1,100 plus verses. Matthew being the second largest at about 1068, 69. Uh, John is in the 800 range and Mark is down by himself in the 600s. Clearly the smallest Gospel. Mark is a very concise and quick Gospel. When you say numbers like Matthew contains 90% of Mark. That sounds like a lot until you compare their sizes. And what you see is that Matthew, while he does contain 90% of Mark, is almost twice the size. So he has plenty of information on his own, similarly with Luke. So this becomes important in the copying category to try to figure out, well, they're not even saying anything differently. Well, clearly they are. And even within the things that they copy, as I've already previously shown you, Matthew puts his own flair to things for a Jewish audience. So that was the first thing I wanted to address. And I guess I should bring it into a question. Sure, yeah. As, so, ask David a question about so, it, and then you guys okay, can so talk I would, about it. So I would say this. Let's start with the authorship. Um, given that we have these names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew and John being disciples, Mark and Luke clearly not disciples. Mark, in fact very obscure. Luke, if it wasn't for the gospel by his name, we wouldn't even know who he is. That's not true. He's mentioned in Paul's letter. It's where they got the name in the first place. Wait, but what I'm saying is we wouldn't know, okay, we wouldn't know anything about Luke. Mm. We wouldn't know who he is is what I mean by we wouldn't know anything about Luke. Not that he was never mentioned. My point is this. If you were going to put out a document and claim it was the authority, the as Mark begins, the gospel of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Why would you attribute it to Mark? If it's Peter's story, why wouldn't you attribute it to Peter? Why Mark? Why there's, would Mark be a significant name? There's a, that's a great question. There's a great answer for that. Um, all those names, as I mentioned, were added in the second century. Those were not the only names floating around. These were not the only gospels that had those names floating around. We actually did have a gospel of Peter, and gospel of Peter during the time of the second century was far more popular, for instance, than the Gospel of Mark. We have three times as many texts, surviving texts of the Gospel of Peter as we did of the Gospel of Mark in that same time. Unfortunately, the Gospel of Peter is not in our Bibles anymore. Why is that? Well, probably one of the reasons is, is that by that time, the story has continued to grow. If you look at Mark's Gospel, it's the, the most no-frills, human, fallible Jesus we have. He doesn't always get his miracles right. He makes mistakes. He loses his temper. He can be to people sometimes. And yet he dies in total agony on the cross saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew doesn't like that so much. It's not just that Matthew is a bigger gospel. It's absolutely, it's a bigger gospel. But it is built on that first gospel. And he takes it and carefully changes things. Uh, uh, expands on it, adds uh, things like a nativity that wasn't okay, in Okay, but hold on, hold on one second. What I'm asking mm. is why would you choose an obscure name like Mark, who, for example, let's know who Mark is, just so you know. He's mentioned in Acts. Mark is a traveling companion of the apostles Paul and Barnabas. He turns into basically a coward and wants to flee, and so Barnabas and Paul have a disagreement. They fight over him, and they basically split. Now, this is the man you're going to choose as an authority, someone who ended up as a coward and left the ministry to write Peter's gospel and put the name to it? Why not Peter? That's what I want to know. Why well, would you choose Peter the name Mark unless it really was Mark? Peter was Christ three times before the cock crowed. But here's the real answer so, to that Okay, question. so you're, so you're dealing between question. two cowards. The answer is that some other gospel beat him to it, and that gospel is what we call the gospel of Peter. 
We don't have it anymore. It didn't survive. The okay. names they got attributed to in the second, uh, that was a whole arms race that was going on. And some people said, oh, we've got the Gospel of Mary. We've got the Gospel of Judas. We've got the Gospel. You've got the Gospel of Thomas. Well, we've got the Gospel of John. They, there were all these jockeying for positions right, okay. for all these different ones. And these aren't, again, these are not the only Gospels of Mark, the only Gospels of Matthew. The, this is what we have out of all the other These ones are the ones they considered around. authoritative. Well, no, this is one that some people considered authoritative. John, no, for not, instance, was not considered okay, authoritative. Okay, give me a, hold it on, one second, Gnostic, one second, one second. And second. it was considered heretical. Give me a, give me a canon list that had in it the Gospel of Peter and not the Gospel of Mark. You can start with the moratorium, which is the earliest. I was going to start with the moratorium, okay. but you can also what? look wait, at wait. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. They also have books that aren't the same. And I, and That's not what I'm asking. To, I would have to go... Is Mark in Sin Sinaitic Sinaiticus? Yes. Right. But here's the thing. Is he in the moratorium canon? Well, you're talking about 3rd and 4th century documents now. No, moratorium canon is 2nd century. You, the end, the very end of the 2nd century. But here's the thing I'm trying well, to say is, I'm saying this is the time question, when all David. these names were attributed. So why... Why, no, that's why not, okay. So, okay what? That's that's not the time. We know Papias, around 115. 150, middle of the second century. 115 is not the middle of the. Oh, sorry. This, this is the year 2015. Sorry, I, I thought you said 150. Okay. Sorry, I thought you said 150. 115. And I'm, and I'm he gives a credit to Mark having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, an exact order. He goes on to say, Peter accommodated his instructions to the necessity of his hearers. Now, that's a key point, too, because that shows you that Mark wrote, who I think is your Stop. intellect. Stop. One when second. You say it shows Mark wrote, that's the opposite of truth. One second. Let me, let me finish what I was saying. Hold on. Hold on. Let, let, let John finish. I think what, one thing that you threw out there was that Mark has this kind of duo, schizophrenic, you know, uh, one hand Stephen Hawking, the other hand Matlock. Wait, what are you saying? What are you My point is, Papias attests to right here that Mark wrote down Peter's recollections and Peter accommodated his instructions to the necessity okay. of his hearers. So that's where you that. could definitely have the sense of two different people talking. No, that's not the truth. Because the, Papi, the, the Matthew and Mark I mentioned, do we have Gospels that Papias mentions? We have Gospels that Papias mentions. Those are not our Gospels. He says those were written in Aramaic. He says these were written. He's giving the official church line. I have those the are not exact our quotes gospels. here. I can read here. I, I can go I know, on. I, please do. But with no intention of giving regular narratives of the Lord's sayings, Mark made no mistake writing as he remembered them. He took a special care not to omit anything he heard, not to put anything fictitious into statements. He's claiming that Mark did He's due diligence claim, by Peter's testimony. Claim. Right. Well, then now, why is it that all the other Gospels have more information about Peter than that Gospel? Not, not in comparison to the size of them. No, that is not true at all. I can for show instance, you another chart instance, right now. Every other Gospel has... Uh, Jesus saying to Peter, you are going to be the rock on whom I build my if church. You do, Mark doesn't have if that. If you do a search... How could he forget that? If, if that's, that's day one stuff. It, how could he leave that out of that gospel? I'll, give, I'll, I'll go to that in one second. But, but let me... Wait, wait, but, wait, but wait. No. Really hold on. Hold on. on. No. I will no. turn this car around. Okay, wait. Let me, let me, wait a minute. No, let wait. me address a couple things. David, hold on a second. slow down. I want to address a couple things. Hold on a second. Let me address a couple of these points. All right. Number one. If you do a search, I use a program called Logo Software. It's incredible Bible software, and not just that, but every electronic document I can get my hands on. I've done the search in that. If you do the search for the name Peter and Simon, you end up with the two largest by far are John and Mark that deal with Peter. Not to mention, Mark, every scenario almost is littered with Peter's side of the story. They're in Peter's house, the first thing Jesus does when he declares to be the Son of God and heals them, or and forgives the man of sins. It's all about Peter's side of the story. Secondly, the point to that is, I forgot. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell <laughs> me something real quick, John? John, I, cl clarify for the audience why this, this is so important to, to, to proving your point. Well, okay, going back to my first, my first point, which is really still has not been answered in fairness. My point is this. If you're going to give an authoritative scripture, if I am going to write the official biography of President Obama and I credit it as written by Larry. No one has any idea who Larry is. Worse yet, if it happens to be Larry, who was the guy who snuck in and poisoned the dog, well, now you have really bad reason to know, to believe anything Larry has to say. Mark had a tainted character. It's not till the end of Paul's letters that he finally says, Mark turned his life around. But at this point, there is no reason you want to give credit to Mark. Why not give credit to Matthias? Why not give credit to 
the other Judas, the zealot. Why not give credit to anyone else, but not Mark? He abandoned Peter and Barnabas. Okay, uh, so, so, Barnabas. okay so, so your point is that... So my point is, is that that shows authenticity. The reason why they attribute it to Mark is because Mark is the one who wrote down Peter's words. Okay, no. now give him, let's, let's give right, David okay, a solid okay. three or four minutes first to all, respond to that. First of all, even early Christian, like Eusebius said Papias was an idiot. Even early Christian church fathers like Eusebius said Papias was an idiot and didn't know what he's talking about. But when Papias is talking about his Matthew and his Mark, he's not talking about our Matthew and our Mark, for starters. I just want to say that. And that's not something atheists made up, that's something biblical scholars say. But here's the thing. Why did they attach the name Mark? Because they made Mark quickly. Oh, why Mark? Who's never heard of Mark? Well, he was Peter's secretary. That's why. That's the only reason. Okay, so first thing. That's where that you're, tradition you're came from. You're why conflating a few things. Papius in his writings is discredit. I mean, I'm sorry, Eusebius in his writings is discrediting Papius for his theology. He's, no, it's his intelligence. Oh. His intelligence. It's, yeah, it it's tied into straight. his theology, and right? That he, and that he's gullible. But then, and that he's gullible. But he then, says things that aren't true. But then he quotes him as giving credit to the writing of Mark. So it goes against what you're saying. He didn't discredit him and say, and therefore it's not Mark who wrote it. He said, while this guy might be a bozo, he's right about this. I've had plenty of atheists say that to me. I know what that's like, and that's a good credit statement. Sure. When your enemy or your antagonist gives you credit for being right in something, it holds a lot more weight. Secondly, what are you talking about not our Mark and Matthew? What Mark and Matthew? You said no, he's not he, referring to ours. Then yeah, give me the Gospels were, he's referring to. The, 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 the Logia Dominica, these were right, sayings of the Lord in his language, in Aramaic. That Matthews. is not what Matthew was. That is not what Matthew was. He, his, the Matthew he's talking about that's is what not Papius our Matthew. That's what Papius says. And you know, he's talking about a different gospel altogether. How is it different? Because our Matthew is not a collection of the Lord's sayings in Aramaic. The it's Sermon on the Mount, I gave you an no, no, evidence no, 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 with no, no, that. No, no, If you look it up the teaching, Hold on, John. Hold on, John. written in Greek come, that came from Mark's gospel. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, oh, it is a collection of the Lord's saying in Aramaic. No, it's not. It's a take. It's ta a Greek. Okay, I know what it's you're saying. Greek Okay. gospel taken from an earlier Greek gospel. Uh-oh, he has more notes. I've got more, more notes. notes. Well, notes. I brought quotes because one thing that happens in these well, arguments... The thing, though. You keep quoting second century church fathers as if they're an impeachable source. These are the guys who put this together. These, these are, are the guys who made this. These are our sources, David, and you either have to show that they were wrong and, I, and, like, and, and I submit think I something... That. For instance, you the fact, haven't. That, All the you fact you that Mark couldn't have been written before the war with Rome, you seem to just blindly go by that. And it's like, oh, there's no, there, that's... It's not even an issue for you because somebody in the second century said that. Somebody who works for Jesus, somebody who's part of Jesus Co. said, oh, yeah, the official party line is, the, is co totally correct. Well, no. no, duh, they'll say that. No. Of course they'd say that. Who else would did, they say did that? Did you just say Jesus Co.? Right, right now. <laughs> let, let me, let me, let I me, know what I'm talking about. Let me back up to your, uh, let me back up to your statement oh. about Papias. Okay. What Papias tells us is that Matthew, and I, I'll just put it this and way. You I can look honest, into our stuff. I don't I, really give a rat about what Papias says because I everything do. I know about Papias, even other Christians said he, right. he's gullible and he repeats stuff that's not true. Okay. And he says things what, like... Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me Polycarp answer you. What, you before. Hold on. what Papias <laughs> says, and, I, and, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna do some, what goes against my better nature is just paraphrasing people and just, because you run the risk of being sure. wrong or just getting it wrong. Sure, sure, sure. So, without trying to fumble through and find papers, um, not as good as that as I wish I was. What I'm just gonna do is paraphrase what he says the way I see that he says it, and you can go read these things for yourself. Papias says that Matthew wrote for his Jewish hearers, according to his Jewish hearers. That's what David's talking about. Not saying that he didn't write in Greek, he wrote in Aramaic. What he did was form the story so that the Jews would understand it better. This is exactly the same point I was making. He adds things like, pray that it doesn't come in the winter, or the Sabbath. Jesus can't trip over a rock without Matthew mentioning that this was done to fulfill prophecy. And not just prophecy. He'll tell you this was from Daniel. This was from Zechariah. This was from Isaiah. He's littered with Jewish symbolism, Jewish analogy, Jewish history. He wants his Jewish audience to hear it. Mark was written for a Gentile audience. And it was a quick, quick, brief synopsis. So this thing of saying it's, it's difference between Greek and Aramaic, he's reaching Jewish people, so he has a Jewish flair to it. We don't disagree on that. What? But that is the Matthew that Papias is referring to. There is no other. And if you think okay. there is, present it to me. Because I've given you first century evidence from Clement, Ignatius, and many others that wait, wait. those were quoted. Okay. okay. When you talk about Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, when you're talking about figures like Ignatius and Polycarp, we don't 
agree that those are even authentic writings. We think those stories came to us from people like Pepe. That's Papias. not true at all. We that have their letters. True. We have seven we have authentic letters, letters of Ignatius. Oh, please, come on. We have letters that were written in the name of Ignatius to the churches in there saying, obey your bishop, obey your bishop, do everything according David, to the bishop. David, the bishops... My God, you can even go to Wikipedia and they're going to agree with me on this one. Well, don't go to there Wikipedia. Are, Start, that's, that's my for point. Starters, don't go to Wikipedia. That's my point. You can use that as your source and you're going to find they actually... Please. I don't find that Wikipedia See, agrees with me that often, so that's a big deal for me to well, say. Well, here's the thing. When Ignatius, you say it's you're, just, wait, 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 I want to get okay, one thing straight right. and I want this on the record. Okay. So you're saying that the seven letters attributed to Ignatius are not? I'm saying that they are disputed. And everything that's well, wait, written in there. What does disputed dis mean? That there's some guy in Minnesota that writes a blog that said, I don't think so? Or that scholars have disputed this? Because well, the overwhelming consensus on Ignatius is these seven are authentic. The, the overwhelming consensus for anything in biblical studies is predominantly by Christians for starters. So please don't beat me over the head with the, the overwhelming consensus. So if I turn that on its head and say, the overwhelming consensus of evolutionary biologists is done by evolutionary biologists. Do what does that think, tell you? Do you think that there's anything remotely... How many creationists are in the evolutionary biology remotely department? remotely in the same level of evidentiary proof that's not the point. in evolution as... In, but exactly. The you're, point is... The point is you're, right. The point apples is... apples and something painted orange. The point that's is, is your proof. argument fails because you can't say because a field of biblical studies is predominantly made of Christians. No, 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 no. no. Therefore, saying, they have a bias that can't well, be trusted. When I say that there is, there is concern that these, those letters from Ignatius were not written by Ignatius. Anyway... Let's, let's go back, because what I really want to talk about is Mark and Matthew, and how can Mark be written before the war with Rome? How can Luke be written before Josephus wrote his book? All those things you say, well, they wouldn't have said it this way. Sure they would have said it if they were writing historical novels, if they were writing a, a they, if they wanted to portray to something book. that was happening decades before. And if they didn't, why don't we have these stories before then? Why don't we have, a, if there's an oral tradition, if there's a literary sources for them, why don't we have any trace of that, of anything from the first century? I've already shown you that. I've shown you Clement. Clem I can show you Ignatius and Polycarp. No, okay. he, no, he's not writing okay. at the very end. Again. And, and what you show me is a guy who says things that aren't in Luke. He says that Paul didn't absolute. die in Rome. He says Paul died in Spain. He says this is a quote from our Lord, and then can't. I never get made the claim Paul died in Rome. I made the claim that Paul was executed under Nero. That's exact. That's sound. Okay. He does not say Paul was executed under Nero. He says Paul yes, died in Spain. Yes, he does. He Spain. calls him a beast. He may call Nero a beast, but he says that Paul died in Spain. Under. So do you guys watch the UFC? You have to go. Re you'll have to go. Re you'll have to go read first the first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. Hold on. Hold on. I have, a, I have a point here. Sometimes the referee stops the fight like way right before you want him to stop it. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy, but I also don't want to let it go on too long. So I, I want you both to get your points across. Um, and I, I want to go a little bit long on this segment um, because I know that you were taking a lot of notes during his opening, and I yeah. wanted you to have an opportunity to address some of the things he said in his opening and ask him some sure. questions. Um, but I also wanted to know, um, David, yeah. whenever, you sh whenever I first read your book and I saw that timeline, it was very convincing. Yeah. Going and, and you, of course, say they're not eyewitness accounts. They don't claim to be eyewitness accounts. This is something that comes up a lot in debates. People will say none of the, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most Christians, maybe not people in this room, I don't know, but a lot of Christians will honestly think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are people that followed Jesus around and wrote down things that he said. And so they're like, well, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. Something I got out of your book is that you don't believe that that's the case. And not only that, but John even just confirmed that he says by eyewitness accounts, and John, this may be for you too, by eyewitness accounts, you say, by eyewitness accounts, I mean people talk to people who were there. Well, that wouldn't be eyewitness accounts. So I, I wanted to like, ask both of you about how closely, like he, I guess John puts it about at, what, 40, John? 40 years after Jesus died, the first person wrote about Jesus? No, I, I, well would, before the I would say within the lifetime of Jesus, he so was while being Jesus, written. Okay. So and I can explain that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then all of them were one no, or two? No, no, no. Well, let me that ask you one were... question about that. If that was true, then why do, the Gospels, why do the Gospels say things like, and this is believed even down to our day. Why does Luke start his Gospel by saying, I needed to, so many people are writing okay. Gospels that I needed to go down and see the traditions that were handed all down right, so to our guys, generation. You guys are throwing a lot of things at me, so yeah. let me go back to okay. no, what yeah, you it's, first it's your question and then, question I, can, to then start, I can work up, mm. then I can work up to this sure. point. Um, let's, let's be straight. Matthew is the gospel according to Matthew. In fact, 
the earliest description we have attributing it to Matthew says exactly that. It's according to Matthew. Most scholars do not believe Matthew was written in one sitting. Most scholars believe that Matthew was a compilation. In other words, it could happen just like I had said. Matthew was a tax collector. He has a ledger. He's sitting there with his book, and he's taking taxes at the gate, and he's writing things down, and Jesus says, come follow me. And he says, yep, I'm going with that guy. And then he's sitting there on the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, oh, he's making some really good points here. I'm going to write this down. And he writes these sayings, these teachings down, which we hear all about from first and second century authors. And then what he does is after Mark has put together his brief synopsis of the gospel, he says, that's pretty good, but I got more to add to this. There's a lot more to add to this. And he goes back and he backfills what Mark said and then creates his own gospel using his teachings. Luke says, I got this from eyewitnesses. It's not people who heard people who heard people. It's this is what eyewitnesses told no, he me. He says this was handed down to our generation. No, this that's was not what he down says. To us, right at the gate, he <laughs> says this was handed down to us. Neither one of you have a Bible on you? Anybody got a Bible in the house? Yes, I do, but I also have Luke a, one. Luke the one. atheist has the Bible up front. We've got, <laughs> we got Bibles me, all actually, over the place. Let me just, yeah. let me just read it because this is one I actually got to of my <laughs> he sheet. He does have it, yeah. Luke says, inasmuch as many have undertaken... Not just one or two, but many. Many. We don't know what many could be. That could, it's more than two. But anyway, the point being, <laughs> and inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses of the word and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Yes, those in the beginning gave those to words eyewitnesses to us. from those who delivered this to us. Okay, which is Hold a on. lie because he's taking his information from Matthew. And it Mark. seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Keep it. Now, keep it, reading. Keep reading because there's something I want to well, bring up. That's there. the only part that I have. So well, we the have to most. Grab a Bible. He, he addresses well, that well let me finish what I'm okay. saying with this. If that doesn't sound like someone who sat down and wanted to collect eyewitness accounts to assure Theopolis, who he's writing this to, that what you have been taught, meaning what you've already been learning, what's already been passed to you authoritatively, is correct. Luke is basing his life on the fact that what I'm telling you is the truth. Matthew, Matthew Mark, oh yeah, you can trust what they're saying, Theopolis. No, he doesn't mention these Matthew are and Mark. He says many are doing this. He I'm sure they're say, in the many. He says there are many are doing this, so he wants to give the truth. He's not saying Matthew that's and Mark are good. That's not what he's saying. He's just stealing from Matthew and Mark. He doesn't mention well, Matthew well, and Mark. I, I David, think, that's pure I think, speculation. I'm John, a wild friend. John, I, I, I think... speculation? Well, he does it word for word, hey. not saying... Different of eyewitness, not hey. different. Different. He gives because word for because word, if he disagreed, in. then why doesn't he ever say not, that? What why is plagiarism why not? doesn't hey. he ever state that? That he's why stealing doesn't he, from Matthew and no, Mark. No. Why that, doesn't he say that? Why doesn't he ever doesn't say? He, <laughs> okay. I may not be the smartest one up here, but I have the buttons. <laughs> I wanted to ask. You, Dave. I wonder about that last why? Question. No. Why? Well, I want to say why, the last why, question. Why? Why, question. why do you think? Why do you think um, that none of these gospels were written in the lifetime of Jesus? Because they. All, Hold on. Talking to the oh, mic. They all have giveaways like that. These are written long after the fact, like the fact that Mark seems to be written in response to the, uh, the end of Jerusalem, to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's all taking place before that. They're all taking place in the first part of the first century, but they're all from the perspective of somebody who has survived that. Actually, I shouldn't even say Mark has survived that because he's clearly not even in the same country because he makes basic mistakes about geography, so, about Judean life, that Matthew, a more, a more Jewish uh, community, corrects in his gospel. So, so you don't think Mark, a person named Mark, actually wrote no. Mark? You think no. that, that there were stories that were passed down? No, nope, I when, don't think that either. I think the guy who scoot created up. Mark didn't pass down anything oral tradition. He didn't have other sources. He created it as an allegory, and every single thing, every structure in that gospel that we read, everything that happens and the way it happens and the order in which it happens, there is a structure to it, a chiasmic structure that, that emulates things that we see in the Old Testament, 
and puts it together okay, as a so it's allegory. meta parable. Okay, so then you don't think any of the things that were written in the Bible were written by people who actually walked with Jesus? I, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. Nothing in the New Testament could have been written by anybody who actually could claim okay. to be with Jesus. Okay, so you don't think all any those of names were attached to them because they would have that. Okay, history. so John, why do you think then that they were actually written by people who walked with Jesus? Okay. So first point, let me deal with John, because John 19 specific, explicitly states that this is John's gospel. The beloved who had his head on the, sh on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper, this is his testimony, and we know it is true. This is how John ends his gospel. It doesn't say John wrote the words. It says this is his testimony. John may have been dictating it to a scribe. This is very common, obviously. John is loaded with commentary of everything throughout his gospel that lends towards, I was there. This is the way it was. He tells the event, and then he gives a c commentary on it. Let me address one thing about 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. Okay. Okay. One of the main reasons, and this is a significant point. First of all, it doesn't necessarily matter as great as we're making a big deal of it as to who the actual people were that write it. As long as we're claiming it was, or I'm right in claiming it was eyewitness testimony. If we find out that Matthew was actually written by Philip, nothing's lost another disciple. If we find out that Mark was written by Barnabas, nothing lost. What, what do you mean nothing's lost? Well, it, 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 that's not that critical. The names of who the actual people are, the fact that they were there, they were eyewitnesses is what's critical. Okay. If we find out a different disciple wrote it, it's, it's not that big of a deal, in other words. That doesn't invalidate it. That just. But my point with that, and, and we can have that argument, I do believe it is those four, but my point with that is this. One of the main reasons you'll find in biblical studies that those skeptics that want to place these after 70 A.D., do it based on one of the most common arguments is it has to be after 70 AD because Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple. And if you're a naturalist, which you already saw was one of his points, miracles don't happen, prophecy do not exist, therefore this has to be late. Well, if you're a Christian and if you look at the internal evidence and you see that everything adds up to pre-70 AD, you say Jesus predicted the future and it happened. And here's a key point. Why do none of them talk about the destruction of the temple as something that happened? It's one of the, it is the greatest prophecy that was fulfilled of Jesus's. Okay, can and I? even Matthew doesn't make reference to the fact that it was completed. But yet he'll find some obscure saying of some reason why Joseph had to leave Bethlehem so that Isaiah could be fulfilled. Jesus just predicted that the entire temple would be destroyed into rubble. And within 40 years of that prediction, it occurred. And Matthew was silent about it because, well, you'll figure it out for yourself and put it together. I don't think so. Okay, Matthew wants to make sure you don't worry about it being the day talking. on the Sabbath. Okay, hold on. All right. Okay, hold on. So, so just, just yeah. respond with your couple of points, then we're going to go to break and then okay. do the Q&A. All right. Just a few things before I lose it. All right. You say John ends his gospel. John does not end his gospel with that. John's gospel ends and then other later editors add to it. The, You'll have to get proof for the that. Johanne, well, first, the, the book ends, and then they slap another thing on, and the, another inc uh, I can sit here and make claims and all day. John, they slap John, hold another on, hold incident on. onto that. That's not atheists making this up. This stuff up. <laughs> that is biblical scholars recognizing that. And uh, anyway, anyway. So just anyway, wild but speculation. But Give me something to show that. Here's the thing. If he was, in fact, the beloved disciple, and again, he doesn't claim to be in the gospel itself. In fact, the beloved disciple doesn't even show up in the other Gospels at all. The only reason we call him John is because, again, that's guesswork. They said, well, it couldn't be Matthew. It couldn't be this guy. It had to be somebody who was close to him. Let's say it's John. Okay, it's John. It is pure guesswork. But here's the thing. Not at all. You say he's, his, everything about that Gospel shows I was there. He was there. Well, no, it's written in third person from the, 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 from uh, uh, a, a omniscient narrator, just like all the other Gospels. That's how they know what was in Joseph's dreams. That's how they know what Mary was thinking. That's how they know what happened in secret meetings with us. Not because they so talked to somebody. So in some, not, so in not some because secret meeting. Not reporting inside their head. That's because they were making it up. So in some secret meeting, they said, we need to mention about that pool by the sheep gate with the five colonnades, you know, because, because... God oh, forbid yeah. anyone go try to look this up and see that I what don't we're wanna, telling I you is true. I want to burst your bubble, but there's a great book called Gone with the Wind. They get every single detail right about priests, uh, antebellum, south, and yet the whole thing is made up. It's incredible, you know. The, 
So you'll it's get, incredible. So you're, you're, I'll, I'll, I'll give time for pause. Here's the thing. Well, you well no, hold why, on, hold on. Wait, no, let's, you said, why gonna... didn't Matthew not mention the destruction of the temple? Because the story didn't take place then. The story took place in the first part of the first century. That's why Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience that was very They're concerned about their temple. Religion, but none of them mentioned it because it's all All right, so, so what we're basing this on is a version of... Wait, wait. I want to I make a very good point here. <laughs> Because what I what point. I feel like I keep <laughs> doing is giving you some hard evidence, and what you keep doing is speculating what on it. Wait, wait, where do you line up for your questions? I gave you. We're go, taking a break. Go You're look up. Me. Go John look up Matthew, says, Mark, and Luke. John says nothing. Go look up Mac, Matthew, Mark, John. and Luke. Who the disciple was that laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper? It was John, and John claims to be that one. That's a John fact. Now tell me why you think All right, that we're was added in. We're going to take a break. Come back you with your questions. Me. Line up. Because, because More dog with a bait coming up. if you with me, you'll be a Christian. Keep going. Keep on it. Go. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> If your question is for uh, either David or John, uh, please specify who your question is for or whether it's for both of them. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jan, and my, David, my question is for David Fitzgerald. Mm. Uh, you made uh, a lot of claims oh, yeah. based on <laughs> assumptions. <laughs> assumptions, yes. Yes, okay. there's a lot of assumptions which are not proven. In fact, based on what you're saying, if we apply to you and to your claims the same the same, uh, you know. Go on, bring it, bring it, Jan. Yeah. Bring it. Go how on. do you know anything is true at the, in your claims? And how, how do, do you? Know, uh, that uh, is an excellent question. How yeah. do we know anything is true? Not, not, I'm not finished. Oh, of course. So you, course. you said, and, and particularly, one. you know, okay. one example, you mentioned about G uh, Luke uh, stealing from Josephus Flavius, which is, might be true, might be not be true, but why should we believe Josephus and not Luke and not vice versa? I think I mentioned that. Why? In, in that particular angle, why should we trust that it's Josephus? who's being stolen from and not Josephus stealing from Luke. In every instance where there's a parallel of some sort between those two, first of all, Josephus has it in the proper context. It's part of the story. It's not something pulled out and slapped in as window dressing. I, I heard that, but how do, you know, how do you know that the rest of the sources are right, that they're lined up with the Josephus, and they're not uh, getting it wrong, wrong? Because you're relying on some, on some resources and some sources that you claim to be what? Close I, to the I'm truth. I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. You're saying, well, how do we know that he, he stole from Luke? Yeah, how do we know that all those traditions were right and those who are claimed that those traditions were right or those, those what, history the that, that was right? Luke steals from Josephus are not like major portions. They're little niggly details that he gets wrong. He says he has Gamaliel saying things about uh, a revolution under Festus that didn't happen during his life, that happened like 20 years later. That kind of thing. He makes mistakes in his <clears throat> use of the information he steals from Josephus. And my anyway, question is, how do you but, know yeah, that but, that is true? Well, hey, let me back up a little bit, because your first question was the most apt. It was, how do we know any of this is true? Every single historical thing. He has said, well, what's evolution but, you know, based on uh, you know, crazy guesses by scientists? No, there I is lines of evidence by, uh, that support any claim in anything. And in biblical, his not just biblical history, but any kind of history, every single claim we make is provisional based on how many lines of evidence support it and how plausible it is. Not how possible, but how plausible. It's a, given the context, given what we know, of it, giving uh, other things. So hey, for David, instance, David, hold on. T to clarify, John didn't say that science was made up by crazy claims by Did scientists. No, 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 let me, let me clarify. What he was saying is when you challenged him, let's not, let's not talk about that about Bible is true because... Yeah, biblical scholars are mostly Christian. He says, then why would you trust evolution? Because it's all evolutionary biologists. So I think, no, no, I think no, no, your point is, I think your, it's they the evidence. The, the, right, the evidence. that's what I was trying to get to, they is that that's, that's his point. Is Nothing that in biblical studies is on the same evidentiary level as anything in the physical sciences at all, at all. Whether Christianity is true or not, whether Jesus was real or not, it's still not the same at all. You're well, saying there's, there's not be, enough let's evidence. Be, and, and let's be fair in that history. statement. One that's second. That's true of anything in ancient history. Thank you. Th thank you for your that's question. We said, appreciate it. Let's be fair. That's true of history. You're comparing apples to bananas at this point. You uh, can't claim that a, yeah. that a physical science and going back into history, reading people's writings and trying to piece that. together okay. whether or not they're right or wrong is different. Let me make one quick point about Josephus right. with okay. that because there always seems to be a lot of stock put into Josephus when he seems to disagree with Luke. But that is an excellent question. How do you know he's right and Luke's wrong? Let me give you another example with Josephus. In his, in his the Wars of the Jews, he makes a reference to Archelaus, who was Herod's son, having a dream. And in the dream, he sees nine ears of corn, and they're eaten by an ox. 
and it bothers him, and he finds out that each year represents, or each ear of corn represents a year, and he tells a story about it, that that would be how long his, his uh, reign would be. Well, the problem is that was written around 75 A.D. When Josephus revises that story in about 94 A.D. in his Antiquities, he matches how long Archelaus was a reign, which what would was, you which about was that, John? 10 years. What and would he, you conclude about And that, he John? says, no, it wasn't nine years of corn. It was 10 years of corn. Actually, he doesn't correct it. He just states it was 10 years of corn because he wants to Why be does right that matter? with the fact. Stop, stop, so the please. point that's right about that is, first of all, we see Josephus can be wrong about something. Absolutely. And secondly, he goes back and corrects himself on it because, and he doesn't do it in an honorable way. He does it in a sneaky under the table type of way. Josephus is not the most credible source you would want to look at for holding up the truth of history. Go read the aberrations that he talks about at the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem okay, hold on. We gotta get back to more with questions. a cow You're giving birth to a lamb. All right, he has John. all kinds of hair brains. I tend to go on too long. All right, go ahead. I gotta go on at least You can once. state your first name if you want to. Wait, and wait, then okay. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew, and this all question right. is for John. Okay. Yes. Uh, why do you follow, worship, and study the New Testament as opposed to other works that maintain more reliability, such as the Quran, or uh, older works such as the Hindu Vedas? Well, it's a okay, question. by the Quran's reliability, I think I've shown you a timeline that puts these testimonies fairly cr close. The Quran was developed by dictation to the to the Prophet Muhammad, who was in a cave, and um, he was according to it. Though it says it's the word of God. Absolutely. So let's hear how it was put together, because that's how we need to judge it. It was oral tradition that was dictated to him for over 200 years, where then it was finally put into writing. So that line that I had talked about of evidence doesn't exist in that. Okay, go oh, ahead. But uh, my question in it, though, is it is the word of God. So why is that not a part of your uh, particular scripture, I guess? Well, anything... Because it does say it's the word of God. Uh, that's that's it, your it, point. It, it because it says it's the word of God, then you should believe it's the well, word no, of God. No, no, I don't Muslims subscribe to that. Say that it's the word of God. Well, I don't care who says part. anything is the well, word of God. So basically what you're saying... I don't subscribe to that. So, John... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because now, hold on. What does that have to do with Papias? I set it out from the beginning. I'm not claiming this is the word of God. While I may believe it, Papias is making a statement that no one refuted, no uh, one argued against. Wait, no, uh, David did. Fitzgerald. No, did, no, no, no. no I'm, but I'm talking hundreds of years later, at the time of his reign. Guys, let me clarify. I think what he's getting at is when you were talking earlier, you mentioned that that their stories were based on on scriptures. Their stories were based on eyewitness testimony. The Quran was not. Says you. The Quran is based on oral traditions over 200 years that were supposedly dictated to Muhammad in a cave that, so, no one uh, else, so John, that no one else has any information so, about. So what you're saying then is that just because a book says it's the word of God doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Absolutely, I agree Absolutely. with that. So, I've, I haven't even made that statement at once tonight. Okay, I'm not arguing. Great question. I do believe it's the word of God, and we can talk about that if David wants to give me the next 40 five minutes to the preach, so <laughs> but the word of God. that's not the argument we're having tonight. Well, then that's all right. of your arguments kind of fall apart if it's not the word of God. Because why that's would what they fall apart? Around. What? Why, why, why would they fall apart? Because Jesus was the son of God, and if he wasn't the son of God, then your entire basis of Christianity becomes untrue because he's the center of Christianity. In the but we're not arguing whether the Bible is the word of God. That's a separate argument. I'll have that argument, yeah. but that's no, not what right. we're arguing. What we're arguing right. is can you trust these writings to be the testimony of Jesus, meaning the eyewitness story of Jesus. That's what we're arguing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Your name? My name is Danette. Hi. So my question is for David, and I have like a laundry list. But, oh um, uh oh. <laughs> How many you got there? We, we don't uh, have time a, for it. Just a few. Uh, so that's more um, than two. <laughs> David would, um, well, where a few are gathered, I don't know. That could be argued. Um, you say yourself that Mark is Peter's secretary. Would you agree with that statement? No. That's what he was attributed to be. That's the official story. Okay. Would you, for argument's sake, say that that could be true? Uh, no. Whoever wrote it At was all. not an Aramaic speaker. He was a Greek speaker. He was an educated theologian. He was not that, some... That brings up a point, too, so well, I'll get there. So okay, I was just ahead. saying you said yourself... In the statement. And he makes all these mistakes that somebody who lived in Judea around the time that Jesus wouldn't have made. Many, many, many mistakes. Okay. Which, some of which Luke copies unbeknownst to himself, some of which, many of which Matthew corrects. So somewhere I put, you say yourself, David, Mark is Peter's secretary. That's, so mm -hmm. that, do you have a secretary? Sorry? Do you have a secretary? 
What is that? You're, you're I going, was just you're saying. You're going to analogy land and you're going to no, have a gotcha question at the end. At the end, I'm going to say, but he wasn't the secretary, so why are you asking me? Yeah. Because I had it in my notes that you said it yourself. I was just asking if you had no, a he, secretary. He, he made the point that he is attributed to being right, Peter's right. secretary. That, but he didn't say that that He's was his belief. Why Mark? It's because, yeah, why Mark? Yeah, we shouldn't listen to him. Oh, no, no. He was Peter's secretary. That's why Mark. Okay. That, that whole attribution was to give him the authority that otherwise he would not have at all. Okay, so then I just was asking if you had a secretary, if she ever wrote down anything for you. So with that point, could that might prove why Mark wrote down things instead of Peter himself writing down the things? So I was asking if you had a secretary who might take notes for you, and then you said yourself that, quote, unquote, P Mark was Peter's secretary. How so would you know if if I had a secretary or if Peter had a secretary? What would be some things that would tell you that that, that was true? I was just asking if you had one because oh, she might tonight. write you down just things. You switching goalposts here. Here's my question. You're saying, is it possible that some guy who was a secretary to Peter wrote these things? And I'm telling you, no. Because he traveled not. with Peter, you said. But that's not how they're And written. Barnabas. First of all, wouldn't he say that right out of the gate? Hi, I'm Peter. I'm I was, I, this is Peter talking through his secretary, Mark. I'm this right the story I'm writing. Why would that be Hi, important? this is Danette on David's secretary. Yes, I why mean, would that that's a fair that question? Why I might would that answer be your phone uh Hold it. No, 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 no. David, so, David let me, let me dot com. Okay, I mean, I don't know. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying. Why would whoever wrote that gospel not say that this is coming from Peter? Why would they not say that this is from the apostle? They know they say nothing like that whatsoever. In fact, they say that this book is called The Gospel of Jesus the Son of God. According to and, Mark. No, 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 they don't say that. That happens in the second century. Over a hundred years later, that's where those names get attributed. We okay. don't have oh. anything like that. Originally, all of them were anonymous. When you read them, they read anonymously. John, do you accept that, that they were all anonymous originally and then the names were attributed later? And it's not atheists who are telling that. It's biblical stories no, the, are saying the, the, the thing about that, the reason why that's a difficult thing to answer is they were written... Okay, if you know anything about Christianity... I just want to know if you accept right. that... Well, well, no, because that's, it's not, I have to say it this way. If you know anything about Christianity, you know the purpose is not my will be done, but thy will be done. The glory is not for me. The glory is for my Savior, Jesus Christ. So I am writing to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, removing myself from the picture. That's the intent that they all had. So they intended okay. to step into the shadows and not be known. That's why John doesn't so even doesn't, mention his name so in the gospel. So it doesn't bother you that they were anonymous in the beginning? Well, by anonymous, it doesn't mean that they, they weren't within the writings ever attributed to them. Okay. But that doesn't mean people didn't know who wrote them. Stop. When you say There's John, a difference there. John takes his name out of it. John doesn't just take his name out of it. He takes out the fact that the beloved disciple is the guy writing this at all. And it... Wait, wait, wait. What? There he is says no this point was written by no, the beloved disciple. Not. That was an letter. That's you're going to have to show proof of that because I can start making claims of anything, you look David. In your Christian encyclopedia, look up Johannine Appendix and see what it says. So there David, is almost no scholars who agree with you that those are original to John. David. And the reason is because you read the book, it stops. I end, can give you a laundry list of scholars another, that will agree with me on this. I I can't right. believe you can just sit here so, and make so these John, wild speculations hold on a second. without so any So David, David, are you saying? Are you saying that, that that wasn't part of the original writing, that well, that was added? It, it, no, I'm saying it's not even a part of the, re the writing that we have now. You, you read the original part of it, and there's nothing about saying that this guy is John. There's nothing about saying this was written by this guy, the beloved disciple. And what's more to the point is in all the other Gospels, the beloved disciple. No Googling during a debate. I'm not. I'm pulling on my Especially Bible. Especially not on my computer. You're getting, that's you're my getting No bad. Googling. Oh, that's that's your computer. Bad. Hey, that's David's laptop. What are you doing? That's, that is still. He's it would be better if I used here. your Bible. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. I, I want to make this very, very clear. You've never the, seen a debate like this before, I promise you. Yeah, which is probably a good thing. But yeah. the, the beloved <laughs> disciple doesn't even appear in the other Gospels. When you see the stories, Paul, Peter runs to the tomb. Well, in the, the John's Gospel, Peter and the beloved disciple run to the tomb. When Peter is at the, at the uh, trial of Jesus outside, Peter and the beloved disciple are. But only in that Gospel. Okay, we have a lot of people this waiting to ask questions. So, so yeah. I, I guess my question, uh, another question was, do you agree with his timeline of 70 AD? Absolutely not. Okay. I thought I made it abundantly clear that those couldn't have been written before the year 70. And, and then in your lecture, 
you don't give any examples. So oh. you state like. Oh, baby girl, do you know how much the well, long we're going to be here? If I was of, doing examples of how okay. they didn't match up. Didn't so you didn't either? show how they didn't match up. You just stated facts that the gospels didn't match up, but you don't show. You match didn't up give with what? I'm sorry. Proof. Wait, wait. You're saying I didn't show the gospels matched up with so, what? So you know, like okay, everyone says, well, he took everything from the Bible. I'll give him that. So it's from biblical. But <sighs> at least he was saying here it is in Mark and here it was in Luke, etc. So a, you just stated I facts, have a but didn't. I 250 page book there. I would be happy to sell you at the end of this that tells about sell this. Sell me. <laughs> and I have, a, I have another book in the wings that's coming to even talk more than that. Okay, I'm sorry. Look, if okay, you want to debate you. David, you, you can email minutes. his secretary. I got 20 so, minutes. I barely can even. I can let's go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for the you question. Very much. Thanks, Thank you. Hi, what's your name? Ryan. Hi, Ryan. How you doing? Question for Mr. Fitzgerald. That would be me. Mr. Christie earlier quoted from 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul says, if Christ isn't raised, our faith is in vain. Yes. So for the Christian, that's the consequence. Sorry, I'm not Are you fighting the microphone right now? Than okay. the average bear. Uh, the consequence is, at least as we understand it, our faith is in vain. Or you might I would regard it. That. You might regard it like it's all a life. All I'm saying is that Christianity is a lie and your life is wasted. That's all I'm saying. That's well, okay. all I'm saying. No, no, no. I that that saves me. So He's that's joking. I'm I'm really not. No, that's really totally not. fine. Or you could say it's, it's delusion or life spent in fear, etc. My question is, though, because you self-identify as an atheist, so from your perspective, there's no God, there's no transcendent lawgiver, well, no if, wait, hang on, let, if there is I don't want to interrupt finish. you. Let him finish, Dave, let him finish. I don't want to interrupt you. There's no transcendent lawgiver that imputed any moral obligation on any of us, so, so how ought we live? In other words, how do you deal with the is-ought gap? Say somebody wants to leave here and, and run over a pedestrian with impunity or maybe join ISIS or... A situation like that, I mean, you know, there's no, there's a, there's no moral issue with that, right? Within atheism, how do you, how do you deal with that? It's all on equal ground. Okay, so. thank you. Is the question over? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the question's over. He's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. You must think my neighborhood runs red with blood and raping. No, I'm saying you're inconsistent. I'm saying you're inconsistent. How am I inconsistent? Well, you're here. Now, actually, first of all, this is a whole other debate altogether. A whole. No, other, I know. How much time do you got? I think it's generous of Christians to let atheists inside the Christian worldview to debate. I don't think that's necessary, you know. Ooh, that's fine. You know what? You guys step into our worldview all the damn time. Hey, don't. Well, hold on. Don't, don't do us any favors. <laughs> Seriously, that's that is. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just saying that I, I understand a lot of it. This has all been an internal debate, but there's also an external side. I'm just wondering how you answer that question. I'm not insulting so you. So, so what you're I'm asking? Well, what it you're asking like you is were. It no, like no, you were no, a bit. no, okay. not insulting. I, I believe you when you say you're not. But. So your 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 question is. If there's, if no, there's more, no moral law giver, no exactly. where, where do you get your yeah? Where do you get your morals from, David? How much time you got? How much time you got? Well, but, uh, you know what? It boils down to really two things. It's like, do I want to live in a world where people do these things? Not really. No. Sure. It's compassion and reason. Is, is this compassionate to other people? And is it true? Okay. Those, those, that boils down to that. There's, right. there's, there's a lot more I can say about that. But and that I know it's not that. my debate, but if I could just say that that's not binding on me or anyone else, but that is your opinion. Right. Well, of course, yeah. Okay. Of course, yeah. That's just. Yeah. I'm not the. Yeah, I'm not telling yeah, you. Guys. I'm, not, hey, I'm not even telling you guys not to be Christians. That that's the inconsistency not, that I'm talking no, no, about. No, no, no. Okay. I'm not telling you not to be Christians. I'm saying there is no good reason to be a Christian, and the evidence says there it, Christianity is not true. That is what I'm saying. No, it's but, an, that's an assertion. Is, okay, I've true. got a life full I'm, of good reasons to be a Christian. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, if, this, if we had more people thank like you. John, I love this man. Yeah. I do not hate this man. I think he's wrong, just as he thinks I'm wrong about a lot of things. But I love this man, and if every Christian was like John Christie, I would have a lot less problems well, let's with not, Christianity. Let's not do that. Well, look, I, I, think, I, I think it's really hard for me to not get involved and try to answer your question because I'm no, a no, moderator. Totally, totally. But on this show, Dogma Debate, we deal with that a lot. We talk yeah. about compassion. I've heard your show. I like, I like your show. Oh, yeah. thank you. So, so I, I sp and now I think since you've said this, it's probably time to revamp that. So I think I'll have a segment on an upcoming episode about that. Yeah. Because I do want to address it. We've addressed it from an evolutionary biological perspective, from a scientific perspective, as well as from a, we've had two atheists on that disagreed about where morality comes from. And right. so we, we like to have the moral discussion a lot. So I would just encourage gotcha. you to continue yeah. listening. Yeah, I meant, no, I meant no offense, by the way, to, to anybody uh, here. When I said generous, I didn't mean like we shouldn't gotcha. have these kind of debates. I'm just saying there's two angles things. to it. All right. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. There was some focus on uh, the writing style of the gospel. Yeah. Um, yes. My question would just be, uh, just because it wasn't written in first person, does that 
uh, well, that's not necessarily the only mean that's that. That's not the only reason. That's one reason. Oh, OK. But um, I, I'm just, uh, I guess like the question is like the writing style at that period, did it not contain, uh, was, was most first person historical accounts in first person? Is this a question for me or for John? Um, either I person. I'd love to I'm take it. I, I, I haven't said anything for a little bit. Go ahead, go ahead. Let me address this. That's an excellent question. Because in a time when less than 1% of the population was literate, who really cares about any writings? Oral stories, oral tradition is where it's at. That's exactly why it has chiastic symbolism and things like that set up so that people can remember them. Yeah, there's no mistake that Mark has things that David calls allegorical. No, they're not allegorical. You'll find this throughout Genesis, which he'll probably think is allegorical. You'll find this throughout all types of teaching. Repetition, man, that's where it's at. We got to get this into people's brains in a memorable fashion that they can remember it, recite it, and do it again and again. So in a time when oral tradition, um, you're talking about people who memorized Homer's Iliad. I mean, this is serious. We don't know what oral tradition is nowadays. We have no clue. The closest we can come is remembering song lyrics. Our memories have gotten so lazy. They didn't read and write as often as we do. So this is a big part of the reason why for many years, sayings, teachings were what was most important, and they would get it right. If Cle Clement differentiates by a word or two from the Gospel of Matthew, who cares? They're talking about the parable of the sower. It's the same parable okay. you will find to the T. There's no differences. All right, let's let David respond, and then we'll take another question. Well, first of all, I want to jump back to that and say, do you really think Genesis is not an allegory? Do you, really think, do you really think a talking snake in a magic garden with fruit is not an allegory? Do I think Genesis is allegorical, or do I think that that story let's just say, was allegorical? Let's just stick with Genesis. Allegorical, by the, def of, by the definition of allegorical, no. You I don't, don't think, think it was allegorical. I don't think it was allegorical. I think there is figurative language. There's a big difference there. I must confess, I am baffled by that statement. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Thank you but, for your question. Thank you for the question. Okay. I should, thank you, guys. English okay. literature, but, 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 if you'd like. I just, the one, <laughs> Christian, if that's your real name, um, <laughs> uh, the one question I did say is, it's not just a stylistic difference. And also, what you said, wasn't that how all histories were written at the time? No, they weren't. They, and we have lots of different scale of good historians written from ancient uh, times to bad historians. And Luke is not on the good historian side. And there's many, many reasons for that. Okay. Step on I up. have a list of 84 facts confirmed by archaeology and evidence of Luke's last 16 chapters of the book of Acts. Which he stole from Mark and Matthew. No, they don't, go in, they don't talk anything about the book of Acts. This Let's is the book of Acts. see your magical, Acts. wonderful list later. But 16th I'm chapter sorry. on is Luke's first hand account I'm in sorry, Acts. I'm 84. Uh, don't be Arch sorry. I am okay. highly, highly entertained. This is the best. <laughs> I'm not entertained. Would you like me to dance? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Okay, your name? My name is Olivia. Hello, Olivia. Hi. So my question is, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I was under the impression that there are... Um, periods of time of the life of Jesus Christ that are relatively unaccounted for in the Bible. And when the Bible was prepared for, for printing, when the first Bible was printed, um, there is um, several Gospels that were written that were sort of arbitrarily removed from the Bible because they didn't portray the character of Jesus and the light that you know, the so you're really talking about this whole canonization process, which books were allowed right. in, which books right. were not allowed in. Right, and how does that, how, how does that affect how reliable we should mm. see the, the, one, the Gospels that were let's included? With, okay, let's start question. with John. Oh, okay. Um, there's a couple misinformation points you made there. First of all, just with printed, the printing press didn't come in until 1450. So this, we had the New Testament, we had the Bible long before that. Well, the, I, the first certain people, certain the people first, did, let but... Me, not everybody. Well, let me, let me back up. The first canon of scripture that we have, the authoritative, finalized, these are the 27 books of the New Testament that we're including with the Old Testament, was in 380, um, 380 at the Council of Hippo. Before that, we have, starting in the second century, in, in 170, the Moratorium Canon, which lists, 20, I think it's 22 of the 27. Basically, what I'm telling you is that as soon as people started writing other false gospels, as soon as people started challenging these gospels, these writings, as soon as things started growing into debates like this, they started saying, we need to codify which ones are official. And we can go all the way back into the second century and see that that was already de developed. So by the time 380 came around and Christianity is now legal and they say this is the canon of scripture, 
all they were doing was confirming what people already know. That's why it's so important that I said 36,000 plus quotes from these books, not from the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas. In fact, some of them argue against those Gospels. These teachings, the 27 books of the New Testament, were cited from, taught from, read John. on Sunday mornings, and used for 300 years before they were made into the Bible. Okay, I think the primary question is, how much do you know about the canonization, the, process. The canonization process? And to her question specifically, there were, were there not Gospels that were written, but that were not allowed in the Yeah, in that's the what I'm saying. There was plenty of them that were written and not allowed. Right. But it wasn't that they made a decision in saying, these are the ones that we're going to keep, these are the ones that we're going to throw out. What I they did is, exactly they, they did is they went with the common consensus. We, because, no okay, hold because, on, hold on. Now we're yes, I do. I can give you now evidence. Let me give you evidence. Can I give evidence, or hold are we on. just going to well, wildly make these claims? Well, and I, I've been, I'm, that, that's what I wanted you to do with your time, is to talk about what the evidence was. That's what I'm telling you. From the mid second century, we have canons, lists of what is scripture popping up, okay. all the way even into Athanasius's, which is at the Council of Nicaea in 325, which is the same 27 that in 380 becomes the official canon. It goes back for 300 years where you have plenty of, if you just look up the canon of scripture and look up the canons of the New Testament, you'll see these lists. They start around the mid second century right. and they go all the way up to 380 right. of different lists of what is official, what is okay. the gospel, and what is not. Okay, thank you. Now I want to let David respond. I, to I agree with like three quarters of that. I just want to say quickly, it was just a much messier process than that. Took longer than that. Was never finally uh, canonized at any one uh, council. And as late as the fourth century, our earliest Bibles, our earliest complete New Testaments actually, still disagree with each other and with our modern uh, New Testament. Well, give me an example of just one of these statements you just made. You, look, You're telling me we don't have documents of the 380 I, Council no, 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 of Hippo no, 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 no. that says am, these are the 27 books? I'm saying you said that they did it because they had apostolic authority and all these things. It's like, no, there was never any one time where they able to do this. You could say that it's never been canonized. Athanasius is, is uh, there's, and I'm telling you, at the 4th century, we've got a New Testament. Wait, you, you, you just said, said it's never Bible. been canonized. I don't know Bible. what you mean by that. Okay. Okay. You're saying, oh, for 300 years we had the whole Bible, it's already in one big happy family, and it's just like ours. That's not true. That's not true. The That's Bibles that we got out of the 4th century, Sinaiticus, Codex right. Anacanus, you can look them okay, up let me, and see what they have. Let me try to Guys, I just, got word, that we have, have, I just have. got word that we have 10 minutes and we have to stop all of this. Wow. So thank you for your question. Awesome question. Let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, I, I, I think the point is, uh, and I'm not trying to pick sides here, I think the point is that there are multiple different versions of Bibles that are missing certain books, and books no. are added. The yes. Apocrypha, yes. the Catholic from, Bible okay, has... From, if you're, if you're going to go extended yes, through, the, through the years into that, what I'm telling yes, you is the earliest lists. Okay. The earliest yes. list. I'm okay. trying to deal with early stuff. I'm not dealing with the Book of Mormon. But in, I don't care about oh, that. Hey, I'm dealing what? with and the earliest list. The one lists. thing we can agree on is that Mormon is complete crap, and I have another book about that as well. <laughs> yeah. Everyone wow. in this room can agree on that. No, okay. that's Wait. not true. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, the next question. Go ahead. Let's go. We've um, got 10 minutes. My name is Taylor, and I just wanted to know, this list that you're talking about, John, why do you think it matters? Like, why do you think Ooh. this list matters? Like, these are the... These yeah, are that passages is a good that were chosen for the Bible, and the best of them weren't yeah. at all. Because what happens is when something so life-altering like the Son of God becomes human flesh and at least claims to be able to save everyone's souls from e or into eternity so that they can live in paradise, that tends to change people's lives. And when that tends to change people's lives, slaves tend to change how they live and how they see lives. Owners of slaves tend to change. Basically what I'm telling you is the empire changed. That's why Christianity became legal. If something's getting that popular, we want to get on board. So bandwagon fans jumped on board, started writing fake gospels and saying, we can tell you something about Jesus. Guys published books like Nailed saying, I can tell you something about Jesus. And the early church said, hold on a second. We're not taking this one. We're not taking that one because no one's known about these. They haven't been circulated. They okay. haven't been trusted. They have no authority. We need to come up with a list that says to Christians, these are the Gospels that for the last 300 years since Christ roamed the earth have been treated, have been respected, have been authoritative. Not this other stuff. So, oh, wait, no, I, I need to no. respond to that because that's crap. That's <laughs> complete crap. Wow. Prove it to me. Show me because evidence. Don't make a claim. 
prompted the founding of the New Testament canon. It was a heretic named Marcion who put out his book, the when was that? in the second century, early second century, probably around two thirds or so. That is the impetuous, that theological Sputnik that went up is what caused the Orthodox Church to say, ooh, you know what, we should do that too. And so That's your claim I mean. is- They're not some, oh, we've had this for 300 years. No, that is- Okay, and so your claim is, it then took early, them 100, canons, 150 don't say years. Don't century, don't say third century. So what you're saying is, because of Marcion, around 140 AD, it took them another 140 years to finally respond to that and no, say I'm this is the, the official was, book. Was the reason why they didn't do it till 380 is it wasn't necessary. They knew what was needed. I'm gonna give you 60 seconds each what you want people to leave here thinking about. Mm. John, go ahead and go first. <laughs> 60, don't talk. Okay, so, so we've had this debate about ancient literature and we've talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as much as I can sit here and make these arguments intellectually, I would be so wrong if I left here tonight and didn't say something from my heart. And that's this. This gospel that I'm talking about is not about ancient literature. It's not about historical facts. It's about a life-changing intervention where God of the universe condescended to become a human being. He humbled himself, allowed himself to be suffered, to be crucified by those who he could at any moment control and decimate. But he did it for us. And he did it so he could recognize with us in his sufferings so that we could recognize with him in his sufferings and be raised with him in his glory. And that's what it's about. When I took my baptism, I died to myself. I figuratively died to myself. I gave up my will, and I took on the will of my heavenly Father. As an example through Jesus Christ, and I'm assured that because I was raised from the water, sorry, I get emotional about this, but raised to resurrected life. And that's not something that happens when I die. That's something I am living today. I am in eternity today because of my Savior. So this nice guy David talks about, praise God. Thank you. Okay, David, uh, what would you like people to leave here thinking about? You know, like I said before, snarkily, all I'm saying is that Christianity is lying. Your life is wasted by following it when there are other things you could be doing with your life. But here's the point. I, there's the point. That's not what I want you to take away with. That's, that's not simple. I love this man. I don't like this man. I love this man. I disagree with almost everything he said, probably three quarters to 80% of what he said tonight. As he disagreed with mine and as we both have sources that we can argue about. But the point is this, whatever life is and the universe is, it doesn't care about us, what we said tonight. Life is what it has been for millions and millions of years and from the beginning of time to the end of time. And if there's a afterlife or not an afterlife, what we said here tonight isn't gonna change any of that. So let's be humble before all and i know i have not been the most uh, gracious example of humility or or you know quiet contemplation but what i am saying is that i don't want to believe something that's not true and if i'm wrong about everything i said tonight i want to know so tell me and i'll tell you why i think you're wrong <laughs> Thank you so much to all the groups. Give these guys a round of applause. They did a great job. Thanks so much to all the groups to help this happen. The conversation continues. So, so John, it, it's got to be difficult for you. I mean, for, for a non-believer, the conversation and continuing to have the conversation is extremely important. We have time for people to change their minds one way or the other, which whoever wrote that was making an allegory, a fable.